Dear friends, what an honour and a privilege it is for me to be able to share some ideas on our mission with you today. No one and no group of people has done more to enhance the possibilities of Edmund Rice Education Beyond Borders than you, our friends and colleagues in Europe, and in particular for this gathering, our leaders in England. You gather as leaders in the mission of Catholic education in the Edmund Rice tradition. It might shock you when I suggest that neither the church nor Catholic education nor we individually have or has a mission. No, the mission has us. Mission is an attribute of a loving, inclusive and compassionate God. Mission has a church, mission has a school, mission has us. Since God is a fountain of love and compassion for the world, to participate in mission is to participate in the movement of God's love and compassion towards the world. Our role is to be instruments of God's mission to incarnate divine goodness, love and compassion, to be the loving, compassionate, inclusive face of God in our world. To participate in this mission, we must chip away whatever is not divine within ourselves. By removing what is petty and self-seeking, we're able to bring forth all that is glorious, loving and compassionate. In every person, every human being lies an instinct for transcendence, a desire to experience our divine essence. If we can live deeply in this experience, we will be compassionate, we will be loving, since this is the essence of the divine. Our participation in mission requires that we align our priorities with God's priorities and stand with those who are blessed in the eyes of our God. The peacemakers, the merciful, those who thirst for justice, as well as the poor, the powerless, the excluded, the marginalised, the humble and the suffering. Unless we belong to any particular sect, uh, Christians normally cannot be distinguished from the rest of the human race by our country, our language or our customs. They don't normally live in cities of their own. They don't use a particular form of speech. Most of them don't normally follow an eccentric manner of life. Rather, we as Christians are known by the way we live, by the way that we reveal to the world the God of love enshrined in our hearts. Alongside our call to be the face of God in our world, we are called to see the face of God in the world. As Edmund Rice people, we see God in the poor, in a speech to new cardinals in 2016, Pope Francis warned that the gospel of the marginalised is where our credibility is at stake, is discovered and is revealed. Let's be clear on what this means for us as Edmund Rice educators. To speak with authenticity of the God of mission, the reign of God or Catholic education, without a priority for the poor and the excluded is impossible. This message was brought home to me very clearly when some years ago, myself and a friend went to Sri Lanka to visit a humble Sri Lankan liberation theologian, Father Tissa Balasuriya. Father Tissa had all sorts of trouble with the church. At one stage he was excommunicated for the way in which he 
brought to bear some of the central Catholic teachings for his community, which was essentially Buddhist and Hindu. Father Tissa was a champion of the poor. At one point he said to us, boys, you've come to talk theology, come with me. He led us down the stairs outside of the compound in which we were, the oblate compound in Colombo, to the other side of the street. We, without knowing much about it, ended up in one of those tuk-tuks, the three-wheel transport that you find so, so prevalent in Asia. And we travelled for about 45 minutes to the outskirts of Colombo, to a desperately poor slum area where Father Tissa was in the process of building a school. The school was right in the centre of this desperately poor area. It didn't have a roof at that stage. So Father Tissa took us in, took us up to what was going to be the second floor where we had a view of the whole slum. He sat us down and he said, now we can talk theology. He didn't have to say anything else. We can't do theology outside of the context of the poor and what the gospel means for them. In the West, we can be tempted to focus our attention on the spiritually poor or limit our interpretation of Jesus' teaching about the reign of God as being principally concerned with the afterlife, leaving the here and now untouched. We are speaking here of the materially poor. Those human beings for whom life itself is a heavy burden. Those who have no voice, no dignity. Many have no name, no recognised existence. They lack adequate educational and healthcare opportunities. They're excluded from decisions that affect them. The poor are those who can't take life for granted. Those for whom staying alive is the primary task and many die before their time. God loves these people preferentially since their poverty is an affront to the God who offers life in all of its fullness to all people. So the key questions that we must ask ourselves, three of them, where is God in the reality of the poor? How do we tell these people that God loves them as well and that our gospel is good news for them as well? And what does it mean to be a Christian and speak of the God of love in a world of suffering and oppression? Some years ago, I was in India and I was in the city of Delhi and I was going for my normal morning walk. And I found a family who were one of these informal families who actually slept on the footpath outside of a bank. And just behind where this family were having their, their morning life, um, much as we would, um, cooking in the way that they could cook, um, grooming their children in the best way that they could, um, tidying up their little space of, of, of footpath. Um, uh, behind them was an ATM machine. Um, and uh, at one stage, while I was observing this family, who were desperately poor, um, they would have been getting ready to go out and beg. Um, kids were, were probably going to beg in a different space than their parents. And of course, they would be shooed off their piece of, of footpath um, at a particular time when, when the commerce of the day started around the bank. And then they would return at night time. This was the rhythm of their lives. And at one point, while I was observing this, this family story, someone came across and actually used the ATM machine. Punched four numbers, our simple pin, into the keypad and all of a sudden 
money appeared. Money from nowhere, a gift from the universe. And I observed this family observing what was happening in their particular patch of footpath. I wonder what goes through the minds of people such as these when they see people fronting up to an ATM machine, pushing in a few numbers, and all of a sudden, as if a miracle was happening, great gifts of money flow from the machine to the lucky person who happens to know the code. So many questions arise for us. What must it be like to be a $2 a day family and not ever know the code? What must it be like for the father of that family to see other people so favoured by the gods that great quantities of money flow through to them when he, after preparing his family for the day, will have to go off and beg or work as a day labourer for a pittance just to remain alive. How do we explain to these young children that it's not their father or mother's fault, that they can't access this flow of wealth from the machine that adorns their living space in the way that a painting sits on the wall of our living room? How does this father eventually explain to his children that they may never have a code for the access to a dignified and secure life? How do we deal with this reality in the context of our education of young people in Australia or England? How do I go to an ATM? and not be mindful of the extraordinary blessings bestowed on me by the universe. How do we convince this family on the streets of Delhi that they are also sons and daughters of the same loving God who has a commitment to the fullness of life for everyone, not just the favoured few? Friends, mission is not a call for a generous action to alleviate misery, but it's a demand for building a more just social order. The reign of God is brought about through making this world a better place, through our committed action in the social and political spheres. Solidarity with the poor, a commitment to in denounce injustice and advocating for a world based on the priorities of the gospel. And so mission takes sides. It becomes political and asks potentially disturbing questions. Mission is about the God of the poor, and many of us are not poor. It's about the view from the poor, and some of us are on top. It's about good news to the poor, and that's bad news to some people who are rich. It's about social structures that can produce inequality. And many of those same social structures are beneficial to us. As Archbishop Oscar Romero once warned, a church that doesn't provoke any crisis, a gospel that doesn't unsettle, a word of God that doesn't get under anyone's skin isn't really the gospel, but rather very nice, pious considerations that don't bother anyone. Pope Francis consistently prays for a church of and for the poor. The church of the poor that he speaks about promotes service and compassionate engagement with the world as indispensable to the way in which we Christians worship a God of love who stands with and for the poor. It is a church that strives to usher in the reign of God, the promise of fullness of life and true freedom for all in our troubled world. It is a church focused on getting the kingdom of God 
and its message of justice and truth into the world rather than people into its ranks. It is a church not so worried about the way in which the world might change it, but rather focused on how it might strive to change the world. And it is a church that strives to ceaselessly tell the poor and those who are excluded that God loves them and that the gospel is good news for them as well. Prior to the Second Vatican Council, some of you might remember, the catchphrase was, outside of the church, there is no salvation. This is what motivated the church's mission. However, now we suggest another take on this phrase, based on the priorities of Jesus. Outside of the poor, there is no salvation. In Matthew chapter 25, we're told that the only question that we'll have to answer at the end of time is how we've treated the poor. According to this gospel, on the last day, we'll be judged by God on one basis. Did we care for the poor? Did we give bread to the hungry, drink to the thirsty? Did we clothe the naked? There are no orthodoxy tests referred to here, no creedal formulas to recite, no catechetical requirements to measure up to, not even questions about our private morality, only the question, how have we treated the poor? The Brazilian bishop, Dom Pedro Casa de Liga, is most insistent he says it this way. He says, we must keep repeating it. Without the poor, there is no salvation. Without the poor, there is no church. Without the poor, there is no gospel. At the core of Jesus' ministry was outreach and inclusion of those who were at the margins of his society. He touched the untouchables. He stood against systemic injustice and hypocrisy. He showed that God was not pleased by the blind following of laws and rituals and purity. He entered into the lives of the victims of these laws and he called them the little ones. He included those with disabilities, those with leprosy, the elderly, those who knew nothing of the law, those who mourn, those who hunger, the persecuted, the widows. The list of those included by Jesus goes on and on. All experienced compassion and inclusion that led them to new life. So as followers of Jesus, we should never be satisfied by giving to the poor from our excess. This is a hallmark of charity, not justice. Our commitment must be to centre the poor and to make our response to their plight the core of our mission. This message was brought home to me some years ago when I was in Lima, Peru, and I was having lunch with my family in a restaurant that jutted out onto the pavement, the footpath, and had some barriers um, advertising some type of coffee around it. You probably have them in your, your parts of the world as well. Um, we'd had a lovely meal. And when you have a meal in Lima, um, they give you, instead of peanuts prior to your um, uh, beginning to eat your main meal, they give you some little roasted corn called cancha. It's very good, it's salty, and it actually um, gets you in the mood to eat and drink. And uh, they give it to you while they're waiting to serve your meals. We were at the end. There were about eight or nine of us at the table. And outside of the corner of my eye, I noticed outside of the barrier, there was a young girl and her baby. Now, I'm not sure whether it was her baby or whether it was her little brother or sister, but they were poor and they were squatting down outside on the footpath outside of the barrier. At one point, uh, towards the end of the meal, I was just about to pay the bill 
um, this girl signalled to me and uh, she asked if she could have, her and her baby could have, the um, leftover little pieces of corn that were in a, the bowls uh, jotted along our, our table. To my great shame, I collected all of the little bits of corn and put them in one bowl. I walked across, I reached across that barrier and handed down to that girl that bowl for her and for her baby that contained the leftovers of what we'd eaten. After another couple of minutes, we were just about to leave, she signalled to me again. And she asked, could she and her baby have the dregs of the soft drinks that we'd had, little bits left in the bottles. And this was too much for me. And so I asked the waitress, could she order two more full soft drinks? And they came. To my great shame, I walked across with the bottles in my hands and I leant down and I gave those two bottles to that girl and to her uh, baby. I paid the bill, <clears throat> went back home, and I had my normal siesta, as you do when you're in Lima on a hot day. But I didn't sleep easy. Something was bugging at me. Something was gnawing at me. I professed to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus, who was the great includer of people, the scandal of Jesus' ministry for his time was that he didn't hand out food. He didn't go around Galilee giving food parcels. He didn't give bowls of help to people. He sat down at the table with them. He invited them to the table. I was deeply ashamed that I'd missed an opportunity to invite this young girl to the table. I went back to that restaurant each day for the next couple of days, around lunchtime, not for the food, but rather hoping for the opportunity of redemption, hoping to see that young girl and her baby and invite her to the table. Jesus' commitment to inclusion was a direct challenge to the religious establishment of his day. To declare lepers, tax collectors, sinners and the poor to be children of God's kingdom was a very political statement. In the face of extremely complex rituals for cleanliness and purity, Jesus taught that one could be washed clean with the baptism of water. He taught his disciples to pray for the coming of God's reign, which surely must have been interpreted as a danger to the establishment of the day and an act of subversion. So you could say that it was Jesus' commitment to inclusion that ultimately cost him his life. Friends, the greatest risk for a Catholic school is to soften or drift from the core imperatives of their mission as mandated by fidelity to the gospel and become simply another fine school embracing a tame and domesticated mission. Pope Francis speaks of the shame of exclusion in education when he says that it increases the barrier between the rich and the poor. He argues that if necessary, we must move from our places of privilege and seek out the poor who must not be denied. Inclusion is at the heart of our gospel and exclusion is its greatest betrayal. Our openness to inclusion and embracing responsibility for the other determines our capacity to be truly authentic Catholic schools. Some might say that it's easier for a school in the developing world to embrace this radical sense of inclusion and an option for the marginalised. As poverty and exclusion are all around, we know that. 
Don't let my stories from the developing world cloud our need to educate against exclusion and for the marginalised in every context, including your own. As Mother Teresa once said, Calcutta can be seen all around the world if only we have eyes to see. The most common questions that I receive after presenting these ideas are related to the way in which we in schools of privilege can address these priorities. It's very easy to get discouraged when we look at the challenges of embodying an authentic option for the poor and a spirit of inclusion as reflected in the Gospels when we live in very different contexts. Some of us lament the fact that our schools are actually perceived as exclusive and are easily open to critique on these core markers of our authenticity as Christians. Let's be clear, we must all do more. We are never off the hook. We are all on a journey and must be chastised by the ideals of our gospel and the vision of Edmund Rice. There is no totally authentic Catholic school, but we must all strive towards the goal of authenticity. We must consistently ask ourselves the difficult questions related to inclusion and exclusion. To deny the questions and accept complacency would be the failure. We should evaluate our progress by measuring from where we've come to where we are now, rather than focusing on from where we are now towards the ideals of our gospel, which can seem so far away. This is an uncomfortable space, and most of us find ourselves in this space. But my friends, with the gospel, this lack of comfort comes with the turf. I thank you for being open to addressing these questions. I thank you for all that you do for the vision of Edmund Rice in Catholic education in your contexts. You inspire me with your leadership and I look forward to having the opportunity to further share our vision together when next time we meet. Thank you.